Hello there, I'm Adam and in this video I want to share with you five of my favourite photography techniques. Techniques that you can try that will help to keep you motivated, to stretch your skills and let you capture some of the best images you possibly can. Let's go! Before we get going today, this video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you need a domain name, a website or an online store, then make your next move with Squarespace. Now, I am a landscape photographer, so there is a slight landscape photography spin on what we're talking about here, but it does apply to other genres. And the good news is that for most of them, you don't need any extra gear either. So yeah, let's get on to number one. Now for everyone out there who is familiar with my work, you'll almost certainly have seen me doing long exposure photography. But before I try and convince you to try it or tell you why I like it, I think I'm gonna hedge a little bit first because there are some criticisms faced towards this technique because the, there are people that think it's overused and I would tend to agree a little bit. One thing I used to do, I was guilty of this totally, I would rock up to any old location, whack a 10 stop filter in there, do a long exposure, and just think immediately that it was better. And that's not the case. It doesn't always work and it can be overused in that way. So uh, there is that. But also there is those out there who would say that it's not real. People sometimes like to look at a landscape photograph and imagine themselves stood there looking at that scene. And with long exposure, what the photograph shows is not what you would have seen stood there. However, I would argue that it is still very much real. It's just perceived in a different way to how a human being sees it with our eyes and our brain. What we're essentially doing is compressing all of that time, whether it be five seconds or two minutes, down to one single frame. And the camera sees that. So everything you see there has happened, but it's just being perceived in a slightly different way. And I think for me, that's still very real, just not from our own perception. And for me, that makes it really exciting. And it's part of why I love it. It then creates that really interesting juxtaposition between static, ob static objects in the scene to things that are moving, whether it be water or the clouds. You do need solid ND filters if you want to shoot in bright conditions, but if you do it at night, you can get away with just using a small aperture. I think of all the techniques in photography, particularly with landscape, is it us opens up so many different avenues for you to create these beautiful images. And when people see them, they have a real wow factor. And people often will say that they have a fine art feel. Although I don't think long exposure necessarily means fine art, but the two can come together. I love long exposure used in the right circumstances. I like to use varying lengths of exposure as well. Sometimes I like to smooth water out completely. Sometimes I'll just do a second or two just to smooth it out a bit, take a little bit of the detail out of it, but then still have some detail in the water. So, so many options, so many things to play with. It's a great technique to try. Definitely one of my favorites. Uh, so yeah, go ahead and have some fun with it. Right, number two is shooting directly into the sun. Now, some landscape photographers, for some reason, say, I don't shoot into the sun. And I don't really understand that. I'm not really interested in what you don't do. I'm interested in what people do, the exciting things they want to tell me about, not the negative stuff. I love shooting into the sun. When you see a well executed photograph with the sun in it, it's an exciting image to see. It's often very warm. It gives you a happy feeling. And that moment, even in just in real life, when the sun is setting, is such a nice moment. Think about being stood on the beach, the sun's going down. It's one of the finest moments we can experience. And I love it. And capturing that in a photograph passes that feeling on to the viewer of the photograph a little bit, I think. And I find that particularly exciting. And in, the, the images can be very inspiring. However, there are issues shooting into the sun. So firstly, look at this image here. I don't mind the bright spot of 
the sun itself. But the reflection on the water is completely detrimental to the scene and it's totally overexposed. It's just too much overexposed white parts to the image. I still quite like the image because I just proposed to my wife when this happened, but that's something you've got to be careful of. So if you're shooting directly into the sun, reflections on water can ruin your image. But if the sun is going down, then there is a technique we can use. I call it the sun thumb technique. It's essentially where we take multiple images and on one of them, you block the sun with your thumb. Now, I didn't invent this technique. I heard it from my friend who heard it from a guy in Sunderland who I think claimed to have come up with it, but who knows? I understand it now enough to be using it relatively regularly. But the trick is when you're doing it is to take your normal frame, but that will have it'll introduce flare into the image. And that's what using your thumb does. So take your normal image, then take a second one with your thumb over the sun. And it's best to reach out because the sharper you can get your thumb in the image, the easier it's gonna to be to remove. We then draw them both into Photoshop, having edited them a bit in Lightroom already, and then try and line them up if there's any movement between each frame, and then just take a brush and brush away the your thumb, basically. If you can use the horizon line, that gives you a nice separation so there's, you can't tell that it's been combined. That works really well for me. There'll be a video on how to do that on the Raw Room very, very soon. If you wanna check that out, hit the link down below. But these images that it produces, I just think are fantastic. And it's a fun thing to try, a fun technique to do. And again, opens up an avenue that you may not have been able to do before because you were overexposing the sun. I use bracketed images as well, which I think makes it a little bit easier and gives you that little bit of leeway, but definitely another one you should try. One of the absolute basics of learning about photography is to understand how to capture perfect exposure. Now, I have a free ebook that tells you how to do this. You can go to my website and download that if you want. However, my friend Andrew Marr made a fantastic video this past week that offers a new way of explaining how to capture exposure. Normally we talk about the exposure triangle between aperture, ISO and shutter speed. He's come up with a slightly new way to explain it, which I think is probably better. Fascinating video. You definitely need to go and check that out after you've watched this one, of course, uh, and give Andrew some love and tell him I sent you as well. Aperture and shutter speed can be used creatively. Now, with landscape photography, it's almost like a standard that you want a big depth of field where everything is in focus. And with portrait photography, it's become so common to use a really shallow depth of field because it's nice to blow out that background. And they, those images do look good on both sides. However, it's sometimes worth just trying to flip them. So do portrait photography with a big depth of field and then do landscape photography with a shallow depth of field. Something like this that I take during one of the masterclass videos. I just think it adds a whole new element to your landscape portfolio. And I've talked so many times before about maybe capturing the impressive big vista, but then getting these little detail shots that just add to the whole story of your day, whether it's a flower like this. I mean, so many possibilities. I've got this one here with a tree that I shot with a shallower depth of field where the background's a bit out of focus. And I just think that's almost like the way we see it. If we focus on a tree, the background will be out of focus a little bit. So it almost, it's almost feels more natural, but it is unusual. We can then use the shutter speed creatively and uh, freeze things like waves or go the other way and do long exposure. So I've got a whole chapter on this in the masterclass, but it is a fun technique to play with and just opens up a new avenue perhaps. Give it a try. As you know, this video is sponsored by Squarespace and Squarespace is just the perfect place for any photographer to make their website. I have been using Squarespace for many years now and I can't stress how easy it is to do everything, create a domain name and get your websites up and running with virtually no technical knowledge whatsoever. It's just dragging things around with your mouse 
putting your pictures on there, doing a little bit of writing, and then with their templates, you will have a beautiful looking website that's completely unique to you because it's got your stuff on it. And you can then upgrade it as well really easily to become an online store. Yeah, just a fantastic place to host your website. It looks beautiful, though. great customer support, and I think you should give it a try if you're thinking about having a website. So go to squarespace.com to start your free trial today, and then if you like what you've created, use the offer code FIRSTMAN to get 10% off your first purchase. Right, let's move on to the next one. Often when I'm out with workshop clients, one thing that I find a lot is that they're always looking for a foreground interest to their image. And I will often try to encourage them to not include a foreground because not all landscape photographs need foreground interest. There's a good reason why we do that though, because we want to, in most of our images, introduce a sense of depth. So that foreground creates that as it leads us into the image helping create the sense of depth when we take the 3D world down to the 2D world. That's important. But a foreground interest or leading lines is not the only way to create depth in an image. We can use the relationships in the image between, uh, say, a tree and the distant mountain, or use layers to sort of guide us in through the image. But we don't need a foreground interest all the time. It might be that also that we want to just present an image without depth, a very flat looking image where shape and form or color really take the fore and it just becomes a slightly more artistic vision using those things. And I think that's really exciting. And a lot of my images can do that. The other thing I think is worth trying is using a longer lens because it will help us think in this way and with a longer lens, you might still end up with an image like this one that has a foreground, but that foreground interest is way off in front of you and it's not your personal immediate foreground, but the image itself still does have a foreground. I love using a longer lens because it's just such a nice way to control the story because you're picking out that detail out of the landscape and then what's so important with any photograph is thinking about what we're going to exclude from it. So as you exclude the vast majority of the landscape and just focus on that one thing, it creates a fascinating story and it leaves the viewer and their imagination to fill in what's happening outside of the frame that you're showing them. The great thing about using a long lens as well is that it just opens up so many avenues for you to create unique images, even in an area that's very well photographed or from a viewpoint that's very well photographed. With the longer lens, you can get in there, produce something perhaps without a foreground that's almost certainly going to be unique, especially if we mix it in with the next one. Almost certainly one of my favorite techniques is to operate outside of what we might deem perfect photography conditions, whether that is with the light in the middle of the day or shooting in bad weather. These are two things I think you should definitely be doing. I often come across what the people I deem as photo ninjas. These are people that kind of turn up to a scene with about five minutes to spare before that perfect light, grab the image and then disappear. Now I have total respect for that because we are all operating on limited time. However, it's happened so many times where I've been out there all day, I've captured something beautiful that's happened with the light or the weather conditions. Then these ninjas turn up and I'm sat there thinking, oh mate, I'm really sorry, but you've just missed it. I don't say that, I'm much kinder, but that does happen. We don't need to be operating in the golden hour all the time. It's understandable because it's beautiful and it looks good, but there's opportunities way outside of that. And when I look at all these pictures on my wall here, I think probably 70 to 80% of them are captured outside of the golden hour. And especially if you're using that longer lens to pull details out, we can create some beautiful artwork at all times of the day and in all types of weather conditions. On top of that, it's also a challenge, it's an adventure. And if you do come away with a really nice image, it's almost even more satisfying because you know you've had to work a little bit harder 
and you've captured something maybe that no one else has thought of before. But please do hit the like button because the algorithm seems to like that. And I'll see you on another one very, very soon. Leave a comment down below of any techniques that you like that I might have missed as well. And I'll see you again soon.